Hi everyone, welcome to lesson 35, um, which will be over the derivative product rule. Now suppose you wanted to find the following derivative. The derivative with respect to x of x cubed times sine of x. And in previous lessons, we did find that the derivative with respect to x of x cubed was 3x squared. And we found this using what we called the power rule for derivatives the derivative power rule. We also found that the derivative with respect to x of sine of x is equal to cosine x, and that was actually in a pretty recent video. And now we want to find the derivative of the product of these functions. We might be able to find the derivative of, of you know, this product specifically using the definition of the derivative, but we will find that it's more efficient to come up with a general rule uh, for finding the derivative of any product of two functions, and that way we only have to go through the, the difficult process once. And so what we're looking for is a rule for finding the derivative of any product of two functions. <clears throat> and so what we're going to do in this lesson, we'll start with the definition of a right-sided derivative. So this is just a, a regular old definition of what the derivative with respect to x of a function w of x would look like. Now we define the function w of x to be a product of two functions, which are going to be f of x and g of x. So in other words, w of x is equal to f of x times g of x. And we make that substitution in our definition. So we take that definition we had before, and now we say, well, what happens if w of x is just f of x times g of x? Well, now it looks like this. So combining those two ideas, we get this uh, definition. Now, a few, uh, a few reminders before we really get started, you know, remember that anything minus itself is equal to zero. So if you have, you know, 42 minus itself, we get zero. Subtracting is just adding a negative, and addition is commutative. So if you have negative 42 plus 42, that's also equal to zero. And then finally, anything plus zero is equal to itself. So if you have, you know, 42 plus zero, well, surprise, you get 42. So in other words, you could add zero to anything in algebra, and it, it turns out to be, uh, you know, completely uh, a legal maneuver to add zero. It doesn't change the identity. So now again, making this a little bit more complicated, remember that anything minus itself is equal to zero. So now I have this thing, I have this some, some thing part of anything, uh, which is f of x plus h times g of x minus f of x plus h times g of x, and that should be equal to zero. Again, subtracting is just adding a negative, and addition is commutative, so we get this. Well, negative x plus h times g of x plus positive x plus h times g of x is equal to zero. And anything plus zero is equal to itself. Now recognize that this line here is from the previous page, and what I've done when I went from this line to this line, you know, making these, setting these two equivalent, what I've done is I've added in, I've inserted this little section in the numerator. I notice that this little section in the numerator is this. It's minus f of x plus h times g of x plus f of x plus h times g of x. And these are the same thing, so that we must just be adding zero. And I can just add zero to the numerator um, because anything plus zero is equal to itself. Okay, we're getting close. Now remember that when you have a fraction with multiple terms in the numerator, you can separate the numerator and keep the same denominator. So here's a really easy example. Um, imagine you have two plus three divided by four. Well, that's just equal to two divided by four plus three divided by four, okay? So hopefully that cognitively checks out, because what we're going to do is we're going to take our much more complicated fraction, and we're going to separate that fraction right in the middle of the numerator and keep the same denominator. So again, my denominator up here is h, and so I'm going to keep that same denominator. And right here, let me choose a new pin color. I like to keep it interesting. Um, right here where I have this plus sign, that plus sign is going to be right here. So what I've done is I've separated everything on the left side of this plus sign becomes its own fraction, and everything on the right side of this plus sign becomes its own fraction. But I'm allowed to do that because it kind of looks like this. 
It's kind of what I'm doing here. Okay, so now if we're okay with this, we have to remember that we, uh, you know, if we're limits, the limit operator has a property called additivity. And what additivity means is that if you have the limit of a sum, you can just set that equal to the sum of two individual limits. And so again, what I'm doing is I'm separating one limit into two limits. And where we see this plus sign here, that's going to be the same thing as where this plus sign is here. So everything on the left side of this plus sign, this whole fraction becomes this limit on the left side. And everything on the right side, this whole fraction becomes this limit here on the right. So what I've done is I've separated one limit into two limits using the additivity property of limits, which we've spoken about in an earlier lesson. We will also factor out one factor in the numerator of each limit. So notice on the right uh, limit, change my pen color one more time. Um, and this limit on the right, I have this g of x up here, this factor up here in both terms. And so what I can do is I can factor out that g of x on the right side of the limit. And then on the left, I have this factor f of x plus h. That factor appears in both terms in the numerator, so I can factor that guy out here. Now remember that limits have an additional property that derivatives don't have, by the way. And this property of limits is a remarkably simple product rule for limits which allows you to separate a limit of a product into the product of limits. In other words, here I have the limit of a product of f of x plus h times this whole fraction. Well, I can actually separate that here into two different limits. I can separate that into the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h times the limit as h goes to 0 of that whole fraction. And then again, I can split this limit here on the right into two different limits, the limit of g of x and the limit of this whole fraction. Now, we're, we're, we've gotten pretty far here and all that's left is just a little bit of cleanup. Notice that the first limit above, and what I mean by the first limit above is this, can be solved by setting h is equal to zero. And so let's find that limit if I set uh, h is equal to zero, we'll have f of x plus zero, that's just f of x. And then the third limit above, which I mean this one, makes no mention of h. So the limit as h goes to zero of g of x is just g of x. So what does it look like if I make those changes, do those steps? Well, I'll have f of x times this limit plus g of x times that limit. And the last thing to do is to recognize that these remaining limits here and here are the definition of the right-sided derivatives of g of x that one, and f of x, that one, respectively. So um, in other words, what we can do is say, well, um, let me just replace these limits with these derivatives. So what I get is that this derivative that we've been trying to find all along, the derivative with respect to x of f of x times g of x is equal to f of x times g prime of x plus g of x times f prime of x and this is the product rule written in Lagrange notation. And notice that the apostrophe, which I've been reading as f prime of x and g prime of x, that indicates the first derivative. So g prime of x um, is just the derivative with respect to x of the function uh, g of x. Now addition and multiplication are commutative. So there are actually eight equivalent ways to write the this product rule in Lagrange notation using the function names f and g. So here's eight different ways to write this, and these are all equivalent if you remember that multiplication and addition are commutative. So these are just kind of permutations of the terms and factors of the product rule. Now you don't have to remember all of these. You could just remember one of these, whichever one is your favorite, and it will work just as well as the others. And in fact, um, I think this makes it easy to remember the product rule uh, because I don't even really remember any of these. I just remember it's the derivative of one function times the other plus 
the derivative of the other function times the first. And it doesn't really matter which function you choose to be the one function, which is the same as the first, or which function you choose to be the other function. Um, you know, this is the other function. Uh, anyways, um, I guess take a moment to try to commit this to memory. And if you prefer, I've also written these out using Leibniz notation. So this is exactly the same as before. And again, I'm going to have eight different rules because these are all equivalent to each other. Get them all on the same screen window here. So these again are all equivalent. This is just Leibniz notation for the same derivative product rule. Uh, and now, suppose that you wanted to find the following derivative. So maybe you remember this from the beginning of this lesson. The derivative with respect to x of x cubed times sine of x. Well, what is that? Let's define what our functions f and g are. So we'll say f of x is that first function, x cubed. That means that when I take the derivative using my power rule, you know, the derivative is going to be 3 times x squared. And then we'll say the second function, sine of x, that's going to be my g function, my g function. And when I take that derivative, uh, the derivative of sine of x is just uh, cosine x. Then um, to find our answer, we just have to apply the power rule, which is to say that, uh, you know, the derivative of f times g is equal to f prime times g plus f times g prime. So in other words, the derivative we've been trying to find all along is equal to f prime. And remember, f prime is 3x squared. And here's 3x squared corresponding to that f prime times g. Sorry, I'm going to be switching pin colors a lot here in this last little bit times g, and remember g is sine of x, and so this sine of x corresponds to this g in my power rule, plus f, and remember f is just uh, x cubed, so this x cubed here corresponds to that f in my power rule, times g prime. One last change of marker here. And so g prime is cosine x, and here's that cosine x. Um, and it's there because it corresponds to this g prime in my power rule. So hopefully you can see how to apply the power rule to our example. This is just one example. Um, we're going to practice with a bunch more examples in the next lesson. So thank you for watching this video and sticking it out to the end, and I'll see you in the next video.